Good evening, and welcome to all of you here at Fordham University at Lincoln Center in New York City, and to all of you watching online to this public discussion entitled Francis at Five, Assessing the Legacy of Pope Francis Five Years After His Election. My name is Tom Gallagher, and I'm the President and CEO of the Religion News Foundation, and I also serve as the CEO and publisher of the Foundation's subsidiary, Religion News Service. We are delighted to co-sponsor this event with the Center on Religion and Culture here at Fordham University uh, at, with its director, its new director, David Gibson, a good friend, and he'll be moderating tonight's discussion. <clears throat> when David and I worked at Religion News Service together, I technically was his boss. But on two different occasions, I attended a newsmaking event and I asked David if he was going to attend. He said, no, I'm just going to watch it on TV and file my report. What that really meant was I was there taking pictures, sending them back to David for his story. So you get a sense of who worked for whom. In fact, David's new book coming out later this year is on servant leadership called Servant Leadership, How to Make Your Boss Your Servant. <laughs> We are especially fortunate to have as our media partner this evening, Salt and Light Television from Toronto, uh, led by Father Tom Rosica. And when Father Tom heard about this discussion, he really wanted to be a part of it and sent his team to videotape and to help facilitate the online streaming. So thank you to his team that's here today and to Father Rosica. Obviously, we're excited to have both uh, Ross and Massimo here today. As you know, Ross is a New York Times op-ed columnist and author of a soon-to-be-published book in March titled, To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism. Massimo Fagioli writes for Commonweal Magazine and is a professor of theology at Villanova University. He, too, has written books on Pope Francis, including Pope Francis' Tradition in Transition, and then Catholicism and Citizenship, Political Cultures of the Church in the 21st Century. As you are probably aware, both Ross and Massimo have exchanged their views on Pope Francis uh, in the pages of the New York Times, on Twitter, and elsewhere. Uh, and this is the first time they've come together uh, to discuss Pope Francis in public. So far, so good. So let's get started. David? Thanks, Tom, very much for that introduction, I think. Um, <clears throat> it was great working for you. It's better even working with you, <laughs> uh, especially on an event like this. Thanks very much for coming up with this idea, uh, for helping to organize it, and for the co-sponsorship of the Religion News Foundation and Religion News Service. Thank you all for being here. Again, welcome to Fordham University. Special welcome to our two uh, participants in this uh, this. Uh, conversation this evening. Um, and to say that Massimo and Ross uh, have differing views, I think, is a bit of a, an, an understatement, uh, as anybody who's followed their, um, their exchanges. But, you know, Pope Francis himself has uh, welcomed debate in the church, Parisia. He, he, he wants us to speak frankly, openly, and honestly, and without fear. And I think both Ross and Massimo have done that. And just to recap, uh, briefly, their exchange, as far as I could tell from my uh, uh, look, <laughs> what? Okay, uh, but it's been um, <laughs> it's been a a lively exchange. We don't have to go over the the particulars, but it it has been it has clarified. I think um, it has clarified a number of the issues at stake in the papacy of Pope Francis. And I think uh, for as, as controversial uh, and an ex as explosive as some of the uh, exchanges have, have been, um, that is often tended to obscure the much more substantive and in-depth uh, writings that both Massimo and Ross have uh, produced on this very signature moment in the Catholic Church. Tends, you know, the, the Twitter exchanges, I think, um, tend to obscure uh, 
uh, the writings of both of these men. And yet even their Twitter duels are elevated, I think, compared to the bulk of the arguments of, over the Francis papacy. Those arguments are numerous and they're intense and they cover a wide range of issues, which again is why it's such a constructive and encouraging and I think useful development that both of them are here tonight to discuss their views with openness in person and in good faith. That's what a Jesuit pope wants to see and that's what a Jesuit university is here for. Ross had a uh, column last fall in which he invited Massimo to debate at the platform of his choosing. I'm very glad you both chose Fordham rather than Villanova. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great sign of Catholic ecumenism for a Villanova guy to come up to a Jesuit university to speak on behalf of a Jesuit pope. <laughs> but in concluding a column last fall, Ross wrote, <clears throat> there is no way forward save through controversy. Postpone the Inquisition's schedule arguments instead. So here we are, we've scheduled the arguments. Uh, let them begin in good faith. Here's wh how we're gonna roll tonight. Each of our um, speakers will give a brief overview of their take on the uh, Francis papacy. Then, and they'll each do so from the podium, then we'll come back up here. I'll toss out a couple of questions and away we'll go. Then with about 30 minutes left, uh, we will take your questions. While we are discussing up here, please write down questions on the index cards provided on your seats. Please write legibly. We can't ask them if we can't read them. Make them pithy and to the point. And we will, again, the student assistants will collect them. As we're talking, Tom Gallagher will uh, screen them, sift through them for questions that have not yet been asked themes that have not been raised. And uh, a lot, again, there are a lot of you here tonight. We're sold out. So we'll uh, try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, so put your uh, cell phones on silent. But those of you with opposable thumbs, feel free to tweet uh, at, to your heart's content. There is a hashtag, Tom, Francis at 5ATFIVE. No event is complete without a hashtag these days. We all know that. Um, so who's going to go first? Should I flip the coin? We should get some more drama going. Yes, yes good. Yeah, absolutely. Let me see if I can do this. Super Bowl preview. The lights. <laughs> heads or tails? How do you say heads or tails in Italian? Testa. Testa. Sorry, he lost. Perduto. <laughs> tails, you go for, do you want to go up first, or do you want him to go first? I'm sorry, you're on defend the spot the here. Zone. Exactly. Defend the, en defend the end zone. You receive. OK. Um, well, thank you, David, for that very kind introduction. Um, thank you, Tomasimo, for joining me for this exciting event. And thanks to all of you and to Fordham and to Salt and Light for making it possible. Uh, and hopefully, we will give you um, a, at the very least, entertaining evening, even if we don't resolve all the outstanding questions facing Roman Catholicism at the moment. Um, I thought just I would do my quick overview of uh, the Francis pontificate by essentially dividing the pontificate into three broad categories um, and talking about the success or failure or somewhere in between of each. Um, I think that you can look at the Francis pontificate in terms of its role in shaping the public image of the papacy and the church and Francis himself and Catholic Christianity generally and see it broadly as a resounding success um, in ways that I think many of us in the media especially, um, anyone who sort of followed coverage of the church basically from the end of the John Paul era through the sex abuse scandals, through the pontificate of Benedict, uh, you would have been very, very surprised at the extent to which um, the current Holy Father has been able to essentially turn around the public narrative around Catholicism to, in effect, capture the imagination of a secular and jaded press, uh, for which I'm proud to work, 
and to, in effect, sort of model a kind of a kind of iconography of public Christianity um, that, uh, you know, with sort of the paradigmatic example being the famous image of the Pope embracing a man disfigured by boils, um, but to sort of take that kind of iconography and use it to remind a kind of semi-post-Christian West that there is still life and joy and hope in Christianity after all, and that um, Catholicism is not just sort of this purely oppositional force locked in culture war controversy, that it is something more capacious and potentially more appealing and perhaps even, who knows, true. Uh, so that's the aspect of the Francis pontificate that I think has been generally a success. Um, the area that I think has been a disappointment has been the area that um, he was in certain ways elected to address, which is to say the reform of the curia, um, the reform of sort of the Vatican machinery, uh, the bureaucracy of the church, and essentially dealing with the various forms of corruption that fester within it. Uh, I think there the pope made a plausible start and then in certain ways has sort of let things fizzle out. Various figures who were sort of present as reformers have lost power in certain ways. Figures close to the, to the pope have been implicated or allegedly implicated in scandal. And there's a sense in which Francis has, has tended towards a kind of personalized style um, that, again, is sort of connected to his public effectiveness, but has also, in certain ways, blunted his ability to sort of move forward institutionally. Um, you know, so there, like certain ways, like John Paul II, I think he sort of worked around the Vatican bureaucracy and the Curia without really overhauling it dramatically. And you have a lot of cases with, um, you know, the Commission on Sex Abuse being sort of the most prominent example, where you've had some high-profile moves where the Pope demonstrates that he can actually step in and remove a bishop accused of failing to deal with sex abuse, and that's that's a big deal. But then you don't have the sort of follow through and institutionalization, um, the establishment of processes that are likely to outlast this pope. And so, so there, I, there I'd say there's been disappointment. And then we come to the third area, which is, of course, the area of contention between uh, myself and Massimo, which is the, um, you might say, moral theological controversies. Um, and here, I think Francis has put himself in a position where he is either likely to be remembered as a immense success or as a tragic failure with very little room in between, um, by which I mean he has pushed uh, matters with the controversy over divorce and remarriage being sort of the central issue uh, close to a kind of breaking point and pushed for changes within the church, changes in the way the church at the very least presents its doctrine and teaching, but for many of us, those amount to changes in the doctrine and teaching itself in ways that promise a kind of crisis, um, certainly a crisis for the kind of John Paul II conservative paradigm uh, that was dominant, at least in conservative Catholic intellectual circles for a long time, um, but arguably a kind of crisis for papal authority itself. Uh, where there are, I think, reasonable questions about whether the church is drifting towards a kind of Anglican model of papal governance around issues of faith and morals, um, a kind of decentralization where Catholic teaching looks very different in Warsaw than it does in Berlin and looks different in Philadelphia than it looks in Chicago and so on down a list. Um, and that, I think, is, you know, it's an area where it's it's very hard to assess. Um, my own biases obviously incline me towards skepticism, but I would say we're going to need the vantage point of 100 or 150 years to say whether this, whether Francis has been sort of a genius who's accelerated a process that the church needed to go through to fulfill the true spirit of Vatican II, or whether he is essentially pushed for changes that it is really impossible for the church to make without turning into, in effect, a kind of a kind of liberal Protestantism in Catholic dressing. Um, so that's how I would at least frame it, and then hopefully we can get into the details and argue our respective cases. Thank you so much. Good evening. And again, thank you for organizing this. And thank you, first of all, to Ross for this invitation. Uh, it was the most welcome thing that mm, happened to me uh, 
in the cybersphere for sure, uh, on the Catholic Twitter, but it, it is really something that says a lot on how the future of the Catholic Church should uh, be shaped. I'm going to open with a Bergoglian style uh, kind of thing, not, not very systematic, just a few points. Uh, this papacy, I believe, is a success because it's not about Francis. It is, uh, it sounds obvious, but it's about Jesus Christ. It's, this papacy um, is an embodiment of what we read in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, men and women who still ask, even in, if not always in an open, direct way, they say, quote, we want to see Jesus. So that's why I don't think, and this will not be my way of uh, proceeding tonight to frame this pontificate in terms of continuity of this continuity. I find this um, an unhelpful way of looking at church history at the magisterium because assuming, looking at, at a pope, a pontificate, in terms of continuity or looking at Catholic doctrine in terms of continuity or discontinuity, in my mind assumes one thing, that Christianity at some point was accomplished, was complete. I don't think that's uh, true. I think that's uh, something that uh, has to get closer to Jesus. I think this pontificate is, is telling us, is telling me that uh, in order to close to Jesus, there has to be some kind of discontinuity. So one of the things that I'm going to uh, reveal tonight is how traditional my theology is. But the traditional means a discovery of what changes, what can change. Now Francis pontificate is not about Francis also because it's not about what one may call papal positivism. It's not that we have to agree because he's the pope. Uh, and here there is something that in this pontificate is very challenging for, uh, for so-called liberal Catholics because this pope is not a, a a reformer. He doesn't decide reforms by decree. Just to give you one example, uh, the, the reform of the Roman Curia, they announced the Apostolic Constitution in 2015, and then it was 2016, and then it was 2017, and last week, uh, Monsignor Semeraro says, this year will, there will be no Apostolic Constitution. For, for the, and this is not a failure, I believe, it's a different kind of idea of reform. It's, it's a process that is, doesn't decide things because of a papal ukase or a decree. It's something different. This pontificate, I believe, is very important because it's about what we want to make of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, we are still in the middle of the reception. Um, it's a reception that has happened much more um, at the level of the intellectual de debate than in the real life of parishes for some issues and for other issues. The intellectual debate is totally lost on what has already happened in, in the churches, I think Francis is revealing that kind of different ways of implementing the Second Vatican Council and is revealing some instincts of a return to a pre-Vatican II period uh, for some, even uh, the, uh, the, the pre-Vatican I period, apparently. Uh, it's a pontificate that has become controversial for a reason that should not make 
it controversial, which is, and this is our major disagreement, is on marriage and, and divorce and, and the sacraments. Uh, I believe there is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Synod was about, of what Amoris Letizia is about, of what this pope believes and wants for the church. Finally, I think there is one element that makes this pontificate very interesting for Catholics and non-Catholics alike, because this pontificate really inaugurates uh, the shift of the Catholic Church towards a post-European, uh, and, and that has a lot of consequences theologically, uh, culturally and politically, it's the post is it's the first pope that doesn't come from a NATO country, and you can imagine how consequential that is um, in the in the in some boardrooms, in some governments, and some. So I believe that it is uh, a very good moment to 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 talk about this pontificate. Because five years marks the period, the amount of time beyond which a papacy is not transitional anymore. Uh, we had Pope John for less than five years, and Pope John the 23rd has changed the church. And so Pope Francis is a longer pontificate than Pope John the 23rd, and I, I think it's not uh, too early to start uh, talking about that. Thank you very much. Thanks to you both uh, very much for the, the excellent setup. I want to get to uh, first things first, um, to plug a different magazine. Um, the. Um, uh, <laughs> the um, Ross, to get our hands around this whole thing, you, you, you speak about the civil war in the church that the pope has, well, that was sort of pre-existing under the surface that the pope has revealed, uh, the threat of schism. This kind of language seems to presuppose two equal camps, two, two opposing forces within the church that are going at it. And yet, uh, how large really is uh, the opposition, the resistance, the, the rebel alliance, if you will, in your in your geeky Star Wars world, um, you know how how big? How much, what are we talking about? It you know you and a few folks in the Anglosphere out there, or is it really uh, a serious opposition and a serious threat of a schism that would indeed split the church? Um, sorry, make, making sure I have this mic right. Is this good? Does that sound good? Okay. Uh, I mean, so first of all, to to your question, I think it depends how you define the opposition. Uh, if, you, if you assume that the end game for this particular push for reform change around communion for the divorced and remarried is something like the proposal that Cardinal Walter Casper initially proposed, thus setting, with the, with the papal blessing, obviously, thus setting in motion the debates that we watched at the synods and thus setting in motion Amoris Laetitia and everything after. Um, and, and I'm defining that proposal, and this is going to be a little bit unfair, undoubtedly, to Cardinal Casper, but as a situation in which decisions about whether to return to communion after a second marriage are made by the individual in consultation with his or her confessor, and where there is some kind of set path that people end up sort of following consistently, where it's like, you know, you have a six-month discernment period, you have this amount of prayer, et cetera, it's sort of a penitential period, and then you return. I'd, I'd say that's sort of a reasonable, if slightly caricatured version of that proposal. Um, you could argue that the opposition, you know, comprises a majority, a rough majority of the world's bishops and cardinals, based on the sort of various voting divisions at the synods and the extent to which there was sustained opposition to going that far. Um, but, so that makes the opposition sound very large, and it's why, and the size and strength of it and the seriousness of those controversies um, 
and is part of why I argue in my book and have argued in columns and so on for the real seriousness of this controversy, that this is an actual, actually historically significant sort of moment of theological controversy that we will remember in the way we remember, you know, Jansenist Jesuit disputes in the 17th century and prior theological controversies and the like. Um, but if you wanted to make you know, the other case, you would say that, look, um, yes, there was this, there was this sort of large-scale resistance, but once uh, Pope Francis found a way to sort of, you know, soft-pedal things a little bit and essentially implement, again, what I think looks more like a kind of quasi-Anglican approach where there is no official papal policy, or maybe there is, but it's advanced through sort of publications of private letters that are then slipped into the acts of the Holy See and the, a year and a half later and so on. You know, it's, it's this sort of thing where nobody can quite agree on what the formal magisterium is saying. Um, to that push, you know, the, the open resistance consists of the bishops of Kazakhstan, the Dubia cardinals, um, and some, you know, ornery newspaper columnists with Twitter feeds. Um, and so I think the truth has to lie, therefore, somewhere in between the two. I would say generally that this is much more of an elite battle than a grassroots battle, uh, and that I think could be deployed to argue that it's not as significant as people making a much of it would say. At the same time, I'd also say that, you know, in a world where I, it's, it's a debate that gets at, in a very, I think, significant way, this larger and real sort of long-lasting civil war within the church that, you know, even if, if you went parish by parish through the Western world, you would not find people arguing about Memoris, Amoris Laetitia in the pews or in sermons. But you could go parish by parish, you know, spend some time in the liturgy, listen to some sermons, read the bulletin, and figure out very quickly which side of that very real divide each parish fell on. And if you can do that, and I think you can, then the divide is real, and you could do the same thing country by country. Um, in, in the global church, which, as Massimo says, is more relevant for the future than perhaps the church in Germany and Poland, which is, you know, you could take as sort of the locus of the controversy. So that's sort of, that's sort of a, an evasive way of answering the first half of your question. To the second half, I'll just say, you know, I, my sense of things is that there, the reception of Vatican II is sufficiently and reasonably contested on the basis of the documents themselves that at some point, and I'm not making a prediction as to when this would happen except on some sort of 100-year hundred, hundred time horizon, you will need some sort of actual settlement where certain questions are definitively answered. And at that point, it seems to me, in whether it's a future council or a future pope or some combination thereof, at that point, the divisions within the church that have sort of been brought to this sharp point by Morris do seem sharp enough that it's very hard to, for me to see how you get through that resolution without the losing side feeling like it should just go its own way. So in that sense, I don't, I'm not predicting, you know, the great schism tomorrow with three popes, but I think that, you know, the post-Vatican II divisions within the church are wide enough that I, I would expect some breakages at some point down the line. Massimo, do you have Thing. Well, so uh, I think we will have one separate question for a Maurice Letizia, what that is. So I, I, I'm leaving that aside for now. And just uh, a Maurice Letizia, the joy of love, the Pope's, Pope Francis's lengthy exhortation after the two synods in 2014 and 15 that he called at the Vatican to talk about issues of the modern family, and he, after that, and after the various discussions among bishops and cardinals, he issued uh, this lengthy exhortation of what he saw as laying out all the issues, um, which has come down to one footnote that may or may not allow divorced and remarried Catholics to take communion. That's just to put it in a bit of a context. So when we talk about Amoris, thank you. Thank you. we're not talking, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so here, so one first thing. One thing that I have learned and, and that transpired through my latest columns is that there is a resistance or an insurgency that I and many liberal Catholics, if this thing called liberal Catholicism exists, 
have underestimated. So it is small, it is more resilient than many of us expected. So this is uh, the first point. Second, when we talk about how many bishops were in favor of this or not, there's, there's one constitutional point that we should make, that the, the, the bishop's synod is not the, the parliament of the Catholic Church. It's a consultative uh, body. It's technically one of the ways the pope can use his papal primus. So that is an important factor. I don't underestimate that, but that shouldn't go into our discussion on the legitimacy of the teaching, because that is just not pertinent. Third thing is this, is that the whole debate on Vatican II, if it's contested, I think, and I speak here from personal experience as an academic who has taught in Asia a little bit, in, 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 in Australia a little bit, Europe a little bit, this problem of the Second Vatican Council, post-Vatican II, is eminently a North American problem. Because when I teach, for example, full habit nuns from Southeast Asia, they have no problem at all with Vatican II, post-Vatican II. And this is not something that, I mean, this is really a key factor. So I'm, I'm not saying that everything was fine after Vatican II, right? I mean, we know that the 70s were not exactly a period uh, free from uh, abuses sometimes, OK? But we shouldn't caricature, I think, what Vatican II was. So at the level of the theological debate, there is, I mean, that sounds Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher. But right now, in the Catholic Church, there is no real alternative to the theology of the Second Vatican Council on the Jews, on ecumenism, on, on, on ecclesiology. Those documents, large, especially those drafted by Josef Ratzinger, De Verbum has become the document on revelation, the scripture, tradition, it has become right now the most important. So here, when we talk about Vatican II, I think we should say, sure, the reception is still happening. We made, all of us made a few mistakes in the 70s, uh, but at the same time, I mean, I, I was born in 1970, so I, I'm not technically very guilty of that. I but made many mistakes in the November, 70s. November 28, 1979. So I, but, all so of my mistakes involved. This diversity. is, I mean, I believe that we tend to, to underestimate the value of that theology, to miss the distinction between what Vatican II was, what those documents said and what happened in some cases afterwards, and, uh, and to overlook the fact that the Second Vatican Council was 50 years ago, and the most obvious equivalent is the Council of Trent in the 16th century, and the most important reform microphone is failing. Uh, they were implemented one century after the end of the Council of Trent. So we are still in the middle. I'm not saying that everything is, is perfect, is fine. I, I, I tend not to overestimate the divisiveness of the Second Vatican Council because my experience as a European theologian in the US is that Vatican II has, is much more divisive in the US than anywhere else. For, for, many, for many reasons. So we, so we have a problem in this church, probably, but it's not a problem with the theology of the Second Vatican Council, and it's not a problem of other churches. So other churches have other problems, but they don't come from the wording of De Verbum 8, or something like that. No, I, I think that I, I completely agree, it, up to a point. Um, but, but what I, I mean, I would have said, as a some kind of conservative Catholic ten years ago, um, very much the same thing that I don't th that 
that one of the striking things about the conservative liberal Catholic debate, even within the West, is how much both sides assumed the sort of, you know, the, the definitiveness of Vatican II in many ways. Um, and what was happening was a debate between, you know, essentially Communio and Castilium, you know, the sort of two, sorry, the, not to lapse into esoterica, but the, between a conservative interpretation of a liberalizing council and a liberal interpretation of a liberalizing council. Um, but the, the difficulty is that that debate does not seem to be resolvable through references to the documents of Vatican II itself. I mean, it, and when you come down to it, and I think we have in certain ways come down to it in this pontificate, Vatican II happened sort of before the social revolutions of the 1960s and 70s had fully happened. There was not a clear sense, there was some sense, but there was not a clear sense of what the specific questions facing the church would be 10 years out when the council began. And th those specific questions, the documents of Vatican II don't answer one way or another, and license, and I think the liberal side is right about this, license multiple interpretations that you could call, you know, you can call one the John Paul II Ratzinger interpretation, you can call another the spirit of Vatican II interpretation, but the, imp the possibility for both interpretations is there, and so you still have to have a way of resolving the question of, you know, does the church's moral teaching on the impossibility of second marriages still hold in a post-sexual revolution age? And to that question, I think John Paul II offered a pretty clear answer implicitly in Veritatis Splendor and explicitly in Familius Consortio. And I think by implication at least throughout and especially in this one contested footnote, um, Pope Francis's post synodal document offers a different answer. And that contrast, it seems to me, is just very hard to resolve without having some further answer, some further clarification. And it seems to me, again, that if, if a sort of liberalizing Catholicism is to triumph, it's not, you know, it can't just proceed by footnote and implication indefinitely. At some point it has to say definitively that, yes, you know, this, this change has happened, and it's part of the spirit of Vatican II, but it's a real change and we're going to own it. What, what do you... Well, the first thing is that in the Catholic Church, very few things are definitive. I mean, this is... So, the, so one of the very few definitive things is the, the canon of, 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 of Scripture. But much of the rest is the tradition which is much more complicated than it's set in stone and it cannot change. So, in this sense, you're right. Vatican II came before the sexual revolution, before 1968, before uh, Watergate, <laughs> before a number of things. In this sense, so here Vatican II is a council that is in the line of the conciliar tradition. So in this sense, I'm not a Vatican II fundamentalist saying Vatican II is the last council because I've published on it. So it, 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 that's it. So I think the seal of the prophet. Exactly. So I think it's it's early to think about Vatican III in this sense, as 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 many of us remember. I mean, by having uh, read about it in 1975. And Notre Dame, Father Habsburg organized a famous conference towards Vatican III, 1975. I mean, right now, that thought terrifies most people with, with the use of reason. In, not in, not in, journalists. In the Catholic Church. Well, <laughs> well, because there's a conflict of interest there. <laughs> so here, Vatican II is a moment in the tradition. And we don't know when the, the, uh, the next council will be. My, my reading of the Second Vatican Council is that the future of the Catholic Church may be a step in a direction that is a bit different from the Second Vatican Council. I think it's very hard to imagine Vatican II being ab abrogated and going back on the Jews, on Revelation, on Scripture, on what what happened, I think, and that is the real problem, is that in these last few decades, 
liberals, again, if this exists, have underestimated that there is a problem with the tradition. For, for, for 20 years after Vatican II, most theologians thought that the real issue was ecclesiology, horizontal, vertical, and so on. Now we have discovered that the problem is the tradition. What is the tradition? Because on the one side, you have neo-traditionalists who think that we should go back to the 1860s or the 1360s. And on the other side, there is the tendency to have a post-traditional mind. So this is the real problem. It's not Vatican II. Vatican II is part of the problem of the tradition. And so that's why it's that problem that makes some Catholics, even liberal Catholics, make a Catholic social teaching argument stopping at Rerum Novarum. 1891. This is not how the Catholic social teaching works. And I don't blame them. They want to solve the issues with the workers' unions and so on. So, I'm, but there's a problem in understanding how the Catholic tradition works. This is something theologians have not taken care of lately. And I see myself part of that. I, I don't think Vatican II is the problem, because Vatican II is a very traditional teaching. But if you, if you don't take the tradition seriously and you just think uh, about the church of the future, that's why Vatican II becomes a problem. This one, um, the, the other aspect of, of Vatican II, and, and going to your question, Ross, about or issue of uh, finalization and, and resolving ambiguities, but Vatican II is also a pastoral council. Isn't this an, an issue of um, you know, what's etched in stone, what's written in the code of canon law uh, versus engaging the tension between the law and pastoral realities on the ground, which is, again, what, what Francis is highlighting so much. I mean, to, to so many people, I think, in parishes, Pope Francis is not that unusual at all. He's just someone who speaks like their parish priest would speak. I mean, can you, you, you know, in a sense, there is no one size fits all rule. You have, you have Catholic teachings and then you have Catholic people. And isn't there always going to be a tension there in, in how, in, in that space between? There is, but the church also has an obligation or presumably has an obligation not to effectively evacuate its teachings in the name of pastoral flexibility. And I think there, there has to come a point at which, you know, a degree of pastoral flexibility reaches a point where you say you don't have a moral teaching anymore. And so, you know, the distinction between, to take this, again, this sort of front and center example of this pontificate, the difference between the conservative reaction to Pope Francis's annulment reforms and the difference, and the conservative reaction to what was implied in Amoris Laetitia and what was advocated by Cardinal Casper, I think speaks to the conservative understanding of the difference there. That, you know, that annulment, you know, a, a more expansive and merciful and generous annulment process might risk scandal, might risk undercutting Catholic teaching, but the logic of it was still consistent with the idea that the church was faithful to the words of Jesus on divorce. Whereas if you have a liberalized annulment process and a teaching that says, if for whatever reason you can't go through the annulment process, we have a six month, a six month passage to effectively making your second marriage licit, the church just doesn't have a teaching upholding the indissolubility of marriage. And you can say, oh, don't worry, it's still etched in stone. You know, so, you know, we can find the book somewhere in the Vatican. If you go online, you can still find these documents. That's fine, but the church, has a, the, the church still would have a public teaching that basically says, wink, wink, marriage is indissoluble unless your marriage fails, in which case it's not. And that's a, that's, that's a big leap, and that's a leap into, I think, a different vision of what the church is doing and a different vision of what fidelity to, you know, where essentially where Massimo started out. I think this, this really is, in many ways, the, the core tension of the Francis era is this debate about Jesus, right? That it, it's a debate about if you read the Gospels, what do you encounter there? Do you encounter something that's primarily 
Jesus suspending laws in order to, you know, be, be merciful, be pastoral in an effective way? Or do you encounter this mix of enormous mercy, but also a, a, a real, in effect, zeal for moral absolutes on, 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 the, on the moral law as opposed to the ritual law? And the conservative position, which is my position effectively, um, is that you find the latter, and that the, the and that if you are that the Francis pontificate is basically seeking to apply the way Jesus dealt with ritual law to the moral law, and that that is in the logic of the New Testament and the historical logic of the church a gross category error that effectively ends up effacing the church's moral witness on again what are as Massimo says contested issues of particular importance in the West and somewhat less <laughs> importance elsewhere, which is why this has been such a Western-centric debate on both sides. So we are at the core of the matter here. So when we talk about the Vatican II is, in one sentence, is the Catholic Church trying to become resourced, I mean, getting closer to Jesus Christ. So that's, that's the basic definition of the Second Vatican Council. That's pastorality. So that is a church teaching that wants to behave as much as possible like Jesus. Now, what has happened under Francis, there has been no discussion about the indissolubility of marriage. That has never been in doubt. How does Vatican II operate in this pontificate in addressing the issue of marriage? Scripturally. So if you read Amoris Letizia, this very long exhortation, chapter 2 and chapter 8, they go deep into one of the passages of Jesus talking about divorce, which is not Mark 10 or Matthew 19, where it's clear that Jesus is against divorce. There's no question about that. We know Jesus spoke those very words. So there's no question about that. But Amoris Letizia says we should look at how Jesus deals with those who are already divorced. That is the sinner. So John 4, the Samaritan woman, Jesus asked her, are you married? And she says, yes, no, actually you have four husbands before. So that's how Jesus addresses the issue of somebody who's already married. So here, this, the, the exhortation, makes a scriptural argument that is not a liberal theology unless you think that that building, church teaching, based on the Gospels is liberal teaching. I don't believe that. So I don't want to caricature Ross's argument. So I, I'm not saying that your argument is ideological. I mean, I think it's genuine. I, I, I don't question your motive. <laughs> I'm questioning. I, I mean, I do occasionally. It's, <laughs> it's reasonable. I question with the, the kind of attention with which that theology has been done. So the, the synod never asked the, the, the bishops the question, is marriage in the syllable. That has never been into doubt, is how to deal with those who are already uh, divorced. And in John 4, at the end of that chapter, it says, the way Jesus uh, treated that woman, made of that woman a disciple that converted a lot of people in Samaria. So this is some, I understand that a change in, in the Texts And by the way, a lot of Catholic teaching happened through footnotes. I mean, Catholic fathers invented footnotes. <laughs> really, I, I'm, I'm not kidding. That's why, I mean, every theology book should have footnotes and not endnotes. But so a footnote, in, a footnote in Gaudium et Spes, 1965, is what made able John Paul II in 1992 to rehabilitate Galileo more than 300 years after his condemnation. So footnotes have a role, have a history. So I don't underestimate 
the questions that arise. But I don't think there is a, an argument that can be made about this pope undermining the, the teaching on marriage. Now, in America, in North America, in the US, the issue of family and marriage has a place in the social, religious, cultural canon that is completely different from Europe. And I understand why here this issue is different. But short answer, I mean short, long answer, but it's more a cultural discomfort than a theologically grounded issue from what I can see. And I don't deny that there will be issues because different uh, practices, different applications, I understand that. But I don't think that's ground for saying the Catholic teaching on marriage has been undermined. Um, the, uh, our next conference, by the way, will be a debate between endnotes versus footnotes. <laughs> To will exercise many people in the room, I know that, <laughs> um, really. The, um, but Ross, the, uh, bringing up that issue and regarding uh, communion for the divorced and remarried, but it goes to the larger issue really about, you know, isn't this, is this about the teaching on marriage or is it about just worthiness to receive communion, something, you know, we all do, um, you know, when we, when we, when we approach the altar? I mean, they're connected, right? I mean, I, I, there is, you know, there, there is a logic to why Catholic teaching on divorce, remarriage, and communion developed, as it did certainly develop over time, developed the way it did. And, you know, the internal logic is um, sort of boringly straightforward <laughs> in certain ways that, uh, you know, that there are contexts of grave sin in which you're not supposed to approach communion for reasons of scandal to the community, but also for reasons of your own protection from sacrilege. Um, and again, that you can imagine a Catholic church that had developed a different sacramental theology and a different logic of the relationship between marriage, divorce, sexual sin, the confessional and the Eucharist and so on. But in the church that has actually developed, which as Catholics we are generally bound to think has, you know, had the guidance of the Holy Spirit, you have ended up in this position for reasonable reasons. And again, the shift, the shift that is being envisioned and imagined on pastoral grounds again, seems to me in my, you know, non-theologian's naivete as more of a rupture and a break than a continuous development. And I, I mean, I don't know how deeply into the weeds we want to get, but, you know, the, the point that Massimo makes about the Samaritan woman is not a point that sort of people involved in formulating these ideas over time had never considered before. Modern theologians are not the first people to realize that in contexts other than the prohibition on divorce, Jesus is very welcoming to sinners and friendly to sinners and so on. It, it, there is a logic to the view that there are forms of welcome that you offer and extend to sinners regardless of their situation. And then there are things where you ask for sincere amendment and repentance and, and a change of life situation before you admit people to communion. And I mean, to take a non-North American, non-European example, some of the opposition to the changes in vision didn't come from North Americans or Poles or anyone else, it came from African bishops. And African bishops deal with a context that in its own way is very like the Samaritan woman situation, except instead of having four husbands over time, they're dealing with people who have three wives at once, because Africa has, a, in various parts of the continent, has a long-standing tradition of polygamy. And at present, the church is in the position of welcoming and trying to convert polygamists and to effectively make disciples and followers of them as Jesus did to the Samaritan woman while also asking them to bring their marital and sexual lives in conformity with church teaching. And of course, on the ground level, there is all kinds of messiness and flexibility and everything else, but the fact of church teaching, the fact that you are asked to make this change as you become a Catholic Christian is still a reality. And again, the pastoral logic 
of the changes that Pope Francis seems to be urging on the church are that just as a divorced and remarried couple in the West could move through this period of prayer, penitence, and contemplation, return to communion, and simply take communion for the rest of their lives in good conscience would apply equally well to a man married to three women in an African context. There's no reason, there's no obvious reason why it wouldn't. And again, in practice, it's hard for me to see how that doesn't, again, evacuate the teaching on indissolubility, no matter how many times you're insisting that this teaching remains in effect. So that's, that's sort of my, my quasi-scriptural amateur response. I, I would, but I would also make another point, because you've brought up Vatican II a lot, and you've written a lot of interesting things about this sort of, what you see as sort of this resilient traditionalism that's more resilient than, than you expected. From my point of view, as someone who sort of came up with this idea, not came up personally, grew up <laughs> with this idea that there was a sort of successful John Paul II synthesis around interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. What's striking to me is not the resilience of neo-traditionalism that looks back to the world before the council or the world before 1870. It's more the fact that a revival of that is an inevitable response to the kind of stronger hermeneutic of rupture that's implied by the Francis pontificate, where you have conservatives, especially younger ones in my experience, who look at the John Paul II synthesis and say, well, if it leads you to this era of greater rupture, then maybe the synthesis was a mistake. And that's how you get this reconsideration of the Leonine magisterium, the Mortara case, you know, and, and so on down a parade of, 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 um, of interesting controversies from the 19th century. And again, to sort of go back to this initial question about, you know, long-term divisions in Catholicism, it seems to me that this is, this is the dilemma facing liberal Catholicism right now, broadly understood, that the further it pushes, the more effective changes it introduces and succeeds in winning, the more it sort of vitiates a kind of center-right Catholicism and pushes people who believe deeply in continuity towards the kind of neo-traditionalism that, you know, that, that you find sort of shocking and, and surprising in its resilience. So I'm, I'm curious what you think of that dynamic from the point of view of looking ahead 50 years in the life of the church. Well, we don't know who's going to win the Super Bowl, so 50 years is... is, a, is we know who's going to win the Super Bowl. <laughs> come, on, come on. You've been in America long. I mean... Um, so, here... I, I think one important problem that happened in these last few years, one of the unintended consequences of Pope Benedict's speech of 2005 on continuity discontinuity, uh, which has created a number of problems, is that that allowed a new traditionalist fringe to say, well, there is this continuity rupture, and that's not Catholic. That's the event of the Second Vatican Council, the spirit of the Second Vatican Council, and so on. From that step, we went in these last few years, few months, or few days, I mean, from the delegitimization of the event, of the spirit, of the post Vatican II, to the delegitimization of the documents of the Second Vatican Council. Because if a major conservative Christian magazine publishes something on the Jews that ignores completely Vatican II, Paul VI, John Paul II, Pope Benedict, Pope Francis, there's something that went really, really wrong. And this is not the fault of the Second Vatican Council. But what, but what if it's... I, independent of the Second Vatican Council, what if it's a almost inevitable reaction to the Pope Francis interpretation of the Second Vatican Council, well, where you can always go beyond what, you know, what seemed to be a sort of John Paul II interpretation? Well, what is typical of every pope after 1963, when the new pope is elected, is that one of the first speeches is their plan for the Second Vatican Council. What do we want to make of this? In Francis, you don't have that. You do not have this kind, 
of statements saying my hermeneutic is. So I, I frankly don't see this rupture that here Francis is identified with. So here John Paul II is the one who in 1986, in a couple of weeks basically, goes to Assisi to pray with all religious leaders from all around the world with the opposition of all the cardinals except one, Cardinal Cegarai, all the others were completely against, and goes into a, a mosque, a, a, sorry, synagogue of Rome. In 2000, in, he walks into a mosque. He was a pope of rapture if we want to frame the things in this way. So here Francis is one who is much more cautious. So I agree completely with you that John Paul was a rebalancing factor against the unschooling, uh, the, this kind of extreme liberal. But I, I don't see Francis much more rapturist. If anything, less. Actually, if anything, less. What makes of Francis, in, in our eyes, more radical, it's because he speaks the way he speaks. <laughs> his style, because of his uh, is pop what you have called populism, bypassing the institution, bypassing everything. But theologically, Francis is not Hans Kung. I mean, he's a failed doctoral candidate in Germany. <laughs> no, really, I mean, that means something. That means something. So here, I understand the perception of Francis as a discontinuity pope. But theologically, he is much more traditional or conservative. I mean, I'm struck by the lack of disappointment of liberals for the lack of decrees that he has passed on the Roman Curia, for example. I mean, is Pope Francis a liberal when he, he appoints Cardinal Sarah as prefect of the congregation for the liturgy? That's my no, question. But when he removes the people under Cardinal Seurat and replaces them with people opposed to Cardinal Seurat, it's fair to say that perhaps he's favoring the liberal side of certain arguments. Uh, I mean, do, I mean, the I, I feel like so I I have this feeling often in these kind of debates. So I want to push you on it a bit. From the point of view of the German bishops, let's say, there is clearly a specific agenda that they desire. I think this is this is perfectly obvious and has been obvious for for decades. And the and the agenda begins with um, communion for the divorced and remarried, which was something that Cardinal Casper and others urged in the 1990s and were explicitly rebuked and rejected um, by the Vatican at that point. And it continues through experiments with blessings for same-sex unions, intercommunion with Lutherans in some form, and so on down a list of what are effectively liberal causes. And it, it seems to me very hard to deny that all of those causes have been explicitly or implicitly advanced by the, again, I agree, informal, non-explicit, heavily footnoted magisterium of this pope. Now, you're quite right that John Paul II was also an innovator in many ways relative to previous popes. But what John Paul did propose was this synthesis that, again, many conservative Catholics in the West, but not only in the West, took to be a definitive reading of Vatican II, where you have a new ecumenism, you have a different attitude towards the Jews, you have a different attitude towards liberal democracy, but you have, at the same time, a consistent view of ethics, a consistent rejection of, you know, situation ethics, whatever you want to call it in various forms that was codified in Veritatis Splendor, and that, that synthesis was something that, again, the sort of center right of the church believed to be a definitive interpretation of Vatican II. And that synthesis was contested, and the people who contested it have been empowered by this pontificate. And this pontificate has made changes that have given them a lot of room to work. And I, I just don't, I don't understand the, the, the need to deny that reality. Like, that's reality. That, that is the change of the Francis era, that it is now possible to say definitively 
that the papacy allows for changes around these contested issues of sexual ethics that seem to be not permitted under John Paul II and Benedict, and Western-centric though it may be, that's a big change. Don't you think? No, I, I don't think that. No <laughs> <So> close. <laughs> Honestly. So, <coughs> here, John, uh, I'm sorry, Pope Francis hasn't changed canon law. As the conservative canon lawyers online are very intent on affirming, yes, I, I, yes. So, what he has said with this teaching, he has given this teaching to the church for a process of reception. There's something Catholics have learned from Humanae Vitae, 1968, when all Episcopal conferences, after they understood what kind of situation I created, they wrote letters saying, Holy Father, your letter is splendid. By the way, all Catholics have a conscience, so you can decide. So this is a document that opens a process, and we don't know how it ends, when it ends. Okay, so this pope hasn't decreed first. Second, so one of the most interesting books, I mean, published immediately after Vatican II was of a, of a pseudonym called The Rhine Flows into the Tiber, the German conspiracy taking over the Catholic Church. Now, I, I studied in Germany. I don't deny that there's a, there's a certain self-awareness, self-bewust sign of Germans that I don't think we can really Imagine that this whole process is, is, is driven by German bishops. I mean, they are a very important theological voice. It's a very rich church. I have lived in Germany. I've lived in Berlin. So one of the most secularized cities in, in the world. So when you have 50% of Catholic marriages that fail, under the Code of Canon Law, that means that at least 50% of all children in Catholic families, they never see their, their parents receive communion. I, I honestly, I don't think it, it is something that helps the evangelization of the, of, of the church. I don't think it's something consistent with the gospel. So for a long time, the difficult question was, what has the individual faithful have to do to be up to the sacrament? The, the Catholic Church in this last century understood that the, the question has to be asked the other side. What can the Catholic Church do to make the faithful able to receive sacraments? And I don't deny that that's difficult. I don't deny that that raises questions. I tend to be skeptical about framing this in terms of liberal theology. I mean, Cardinal Casper comes from the Tübingen School of Theology that is an, a, a school of Catholic thought that is apologetics. It's not liberal. It was founded to counter liberal Protestants in the early 19th century. So I, it, it's, so now it's the 21st century, of course, things have changed, but their instincts are not as liberal as we can imagine. That is true. <laughs> isn't this uh, cutting to the chase though? Isn't, I mean, the big question here is about whether the church can change, develop, and how it does. I mean, when you're in the midst of these discussions, um, it seems as though everything can be up for grabs or everything is contested. But isn't this, and even what we're doing here this evening, isn't this how change, consensus, development happens? Is that such a bad thing? Can it happen? I mean, your, your, your Erasmus lecture a couple years ago was, a, was a, I thought, a very potent challenge, especially to the conservative camp, to come up with was it not a kind of theory of development? Uh, you know, I mean, I, 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 think I think both sides lack a potent theory of development, that 
I, I feel like, you know, the liberal side is constantly in danger of essentially defining development as effectively the papal positivism that I'm glad to see Massimo reject, where it's sort of, you know, if as long as this pope, this present pope says something, then that's development, it must be the Holy Spirit, therefore submission and assent is required, unless it's a conservative pope, in which case we can contest it for a while until we win. And then the conservative side sort of thought it had, as I, as I sort of keep saying boringly, thought it had a synthesis that I think this uh, Francis, the Francis pontificate has challenged, but also just sort of exposed some of the inherent weaknesses of it. And I think, again, the lapse into reversion to traditionalism that uh, Massimo has written about is in part a response to that crisis, that sense that, well, you know, if this if this theory of development gets you to the Francis pontificate, then maybe we need to reconsider, you know, what happened with usury 200 years ago, which is where it all started. Um, not really, but you know. Um, so so yeah, and 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 that was I mean to me, you know, I've I've written this book that's very critical in certain ways of the present pope, but it's also hopefully written in a spirit of uncertainty rather than dogmatism, um, because I'm, I'm genuinely uncertain about where the church goes from here and what the ultimate synthesis is. But what I tend to reject, um, both from my conservative friends, but I get less of it from them these days, so mostly now from the liberal side, is a sort of glowing, serene optimism about how this process you know, is, is it's unfolding and it's working out and the teaching will be received and, and you know, it will take 50 years or 100 years or so on, but, um, but we can have this sort of serene confidence that whatever is happening is the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, when I look at Catholic history, I see crises, chasms, you know, massive con controversies that in those days, you know, often ended in religious warfare. Um, and I don't expect this controversy to end in a literal 30 years war in Germany, but I, I think that you have to be look, looking at the history of not just the Catholic Church, but Christianity writ large and its engagement with modernity, you have to be reasonable about the reality of conflict and the fact that you're going to get in some ferocious arguments and things are going to go back and forth in unexpected ways and things can break. Things can leave, people can leave, they can leave for good, consistent reasons, and you can't just assume that the Protestant Reformation and all the schisms that preceded it were, um, were sort of exceptional and could never happen again. I, I just think there is, there, is this, there is a deep conflict in... Well, aren't yeah. people going to leave even if, if there is no change? Well, well, that's, well, that's the other thing. People are just leaving, right? All of this in the West, and not only in the West, in, I mean, Latin America is part of the West, depending on what definition you use, but this is the first pope from Latin America, and the news out of Latin America is that Catholic identification keeps falling under Francis arguably faster than before. So we're all having this argument, you know, whether we're German or American or Argentinian, in a landscape of sort of ongoing demographic crisis for the church. And that's, that's a background reality that also tends to get obscured by sort of ecclesiastical pronouncements, you know, about you know, the spirit of Vatican II is on the move and things are getting better and better. Things have not gotten better and better <laughs> for the Western Church since Vatican II. And that to me is, again, a sign that, you know, this is, this is a period of, of crisis and we have to be open and, and acknowledge it as such. Well, uh, and demographically, we have a crisis. We don't force baptism on Jews anymore. I think that got better. Actually, yes, I, I mean, agree. there are a few things that got better, and I'm afraid... Well, many, that, many things got better. Right. So, but the church did not enter a period of explosive evangelism and growth in the world. Because Western it's not world. a business, of course, because it's not a business, the Catholic Church. That is true, it is but it, is, it, has a, it has a commission to I just evangelize the world. Yeah, I just want to comment before uh, uh, giving Tom the... I tend to be skeptical about writing about what's going on in the Catholic Church in terms of civil war or war, because in, in apocalyptic literature, those who write about the uh, apocalypse, it's not because they know it's coming, it's because they want it coming. I think this is dangerous, so there is an ethos that as a theologian, I have learned in Germany that the unity of the Catholic Church is 
is important, is delicate. And uh, I come from a place that has seen uh, religious wars for centuries, Jews killed in my hometown, my own neighborhood, uh, when my parents were little. So I, I tend to be more cautious because I love my church and I, 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 I think it's dangerous to make this picture of a civil war that may be not, not the most responsible way, I think. Journalists, man. <laughs> <laughs> Headlines. Let's flip it over to uh, questions from the audience from Tom. Sure. So how can we think of the Pope's legacy without talking about Laudato Si, his environmental document? Well, so I think this document um, is going through the, 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 the reception that many texts in uh, theology of the church are suffering, which is the political aspect is immediately grasped, and the consequences on culture and formation are totally ignored. So Laudato Si is an encyclical that is primarily not about the environment or creation. It's about power and about knowledge. And this is a very, at 50 years from Lando Lakes, I think it, it should be at the center of our discussion on the future of Catholic higher education. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would say very briefly that I, I think that in the alternative world where Amoris Laetitia had not sort of pressed us into this non-crisis crisis, if you will, um, I, I think that there is in Laudato Si and other elements of the Pope's public teaching sort of an effort to in effect, proposed Catholicism as an alternative world system to Western capitalist technocracy. Um, and I think that there are flaws and oversimplifications and so on that will take a long time to argue over or work out. Um, but when I imagine a sort of healthy, solid intellectual legacy for this pontificate, I, I, I do see the interpretation and reception and digestion of that document as likely part of it. What's the Pope's legacy to date about the role of women in the church? And a subset of that would be the potential role of women deacons. Uh, for the record, I am totally in favor of it. I think it should happen tomorrow. Uh, it is ecumenically uh, very appropriate. This is interesting because Pope Francis uh, doesn't come from the culture, the background that makes him uh, sensitive to this. One of the interesting things of Francis is that he believes in opening spaces, in opening, and uh, so the commission that has been created um, is very diverse. Um, his language on women is often non, not helpful, to be honest, but the most important thing is that he has suspended the climate of fear for all those who spoke on the issue before he, he came. It's, it's hard to underestimate how afraid theologians were to speak about some issues, especially women. And so this is I think Francis has opened the space for that. I don't know if he's the one who can make that decision. I hope so. I don't think it's a decision that can be uh, kicked down the road for a long time. Also, you don't, don't, you don't seem, uh, if I issue of women deacons, things like that, climate change, a lot of things that trigger many other conservatives don't seem to um, no, I mean, I I, I I suppose I would describe myself as an agnostic, if you will, on the question of, of female deacons or deaconesses. I, I think that it, I can imagine sort of, you know, multiple scenarios for how that would work out that are sort of 
subsumed by larger questions of the trajectory of the church. Um, so, uh, so I can imagine essentially the, the actual role of female deacons would be very different depending on what kind of church sort of liturgically they were integrated into, what kind of church doctrinally they were integrated into, and so on. So I would be, I'm more skeptical of, you know, the view that sort of sees, essentially sees this as a kind of ultimate, you know, there's an end game where you have the sort of displacement of a priest-centric Catholicism. Uh, and I think, and that, I think that impulse is present in the campaign for female deacons. At the same time, it's certainly true that there have been deaconesses in the history of the church. And as long as that's true, it seems to me there's no necessary reason why there couldn't be again. So I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have strong views one way or another. And I see the outcome of that process as sort of ultimately defined by broader questions about where, yeah, where the church is going and what kind of church it's likely to be. Um, and I and I generally think that you know the the cause of sort of moving, find you know finding ways to integrate women into positions of power and responsibility within the church is one of the more reasonable and admirable aspects of sort of quote unquote liberal Catholicism, um, and it's something I would I would vastly prefer a pontificate where that was the <laughs> that was the crux if you will of debate as opposed to divorce and remarriage and the sacraments. How do you assess Pope Francis's uh, impact uh, on people of other faiths? Uh, it's hard to come after the pontificate of John Paul II on that issue because um, uh, that was the real revolution. And so in this sense, the, it, that issue cannot be separated from the issue of the papacy as a global platform that has an extraordinary resilience um, ag against the empires and so on. So that is something that really comes uh, from the Second Vatican Council. This is so one of the biggest legacies. So one of those elements of the Second Vatican Council that we're they were really not aware of what was going to happen. I mean, I mean, Islam was not on the radar of anybody in 1965. So here Francis has, I, I think, has embodied the very high expectations of the world uh, about that. In this sense, uh, it, he has overcome some of the obstacles that uh, Pope Benedict faced. Because we should be honest, uh, the Regensburg speech was uh, theologically about something else, faith, reason, Athens, uh, Jerusalem, but that the public impact was, was that. So here Francis has, has learned a lot, um, and I, I think it's one of the most important today. I mean, quickly, and you probably have a better sense of this than I, I'll just say in my own personal interactions, there's been a kind of breakdown that reflects the way that intra-Catholic splits are, you know, have, have their analogs in other traditions. So the more conservative the Protestant or Jew or Muslim, the more likely they are to raise an eyebrow at certain aspects of the pontificate. The more liberal they are, the more likely they are to, to embrace him, with a partial exception where I have a number of sort of conservative-leaning evangelical friends who obviously have different views from the church on divorce and remarriage um, and who, uh, you know, have, are, are often going on at me like, you know, the Pope is great. Why are you so hard on the Pope and so on? Um, so that, that's been my personal, my general personal experience. And then I think that, you know, between Francis and Benedict, you have two implicitly or explicitly two very different approaches to what is a sort of ongoing challenge for the church, which is the concomitant decline of Catholicism and the rise of Islam in Western Europe. Um, and I, I, since I have no idea what the church's best approach to that challenge is, um, I won't pass any kind of judgment <laughs> on how it's been handled. Thank you. To what extent will issues uh, be decided by census fidelium rather than church edict? Isn't that ha happening already? Uh, yes. In this sense, so we tend to overestimate 
what the popes do, what the bishops do, what the Roman curia. So the pope is much more a witness than a maker of the Catholic tradition. And so in this sense, the census fidelium has always been part of that. What's part of the problem is that the ways the census fidelium is expressed has changed enormously the cybersphere. I mean, this is really something that we thought is going to create a new community. It has created more division. And so this is really part of the problem uh, uh, today. And it's not a coincidence that the favorite paragraph of the Second Vatican Council for Francis is Lumen Gentium 12, where he says uh, the, inf the real infallibility is in the faith of the people. And so the problem is that both in the church and, the, and in politics, the notion of people has become very problematic. <laughs> Where is the people? Who's the people? And so, but that is one of the great rediscoveries of the Second Vatican Council, which means you, you, you cannot force a doctrine on the people. It has to be there in an implicit way, in, in some way. The, un, the unanswered question is, who are the faithful in the end? And I think the, you know, on many of the sort of contested questions in the West, again, you have this sort of, these sort of long-term questions about trends where, you know, if the sense of the faithful diverges from Catholic doctrine, but then those faithful drift away and cease to be faithful, then, you know, then the argument that that represents the true census fidelium gets weaker. And by the same token, you have in you know today's reformers a kind of hostility, sometimes understandable because of the you know horrifying tone of the internet, to what amounts in certain ways to the exact kind of sort of lay and grassroots participation that the Second Vatican Council envisioned. Uh, this is one of you know one of the paradoxes again of the Francis Pontificate is that you have often these contests between sort of you know organized lay groups that sort of work through the internet and a hierarchy that's sort of befuddled and doesn't know how to handle them that run in the opposite direction from what the narrative of 1965 would have led you to expect, where those sort of organized lay groups are conservative or traditionalist or hyper-traditionalist, and the bishops are more liberal or centrist or moderate, if you will. So there's, I'd say, the census fidelium is immensely important, but the question of what it means and how it expresses itself is something that, again, gets worked out not on five-year time horizons, but over a very long and complicated process. So this will be our last question as we're approaching 7.30. Um, is there a coherent way to embrace Francis while also embracing Pope John Paul II? Absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think it's a Catholic way to uh, see one as the coup taking over the other. Uh, again, the problem is what we mean by Catholic tradition. Uh, Pope John XXIII called the Second Vatican Council 16 weeks after his election. I mean, can you imagine that? 16 weeks after the election. Twitter calls, would have gone crazy. Exactly. <laughs> a council that nobody thought it was necessary anymore because with papal infallibility, who needs a council? So we have recently overestimated, overheated this issue of continuity, which has been handled in a much more sane way, healthy way, before these last few years. And I don't see any need to see one is my pope and the other is not my pope. So they're different, of course, intellectually we have to understand that, but I don't see one, the revanche on the other. Um, I mean, I think if you, if you make things very general, then it's very easy to see them as in continuity. Uh, I think when you get to the specific questions where 
elements of Pope Francis's subtle and ambiguous magisterium seem to be in tension with fairly explicit things that John Paul II said, it gets, it gets much harder. Um, and, and I think that, you know, again, this is my boring literal mindedness at work, no doubt, but you know, when, when you have the appearance, the more that you have the appearance of reversal on very public, heated and controversial questions, the more you have a hard time arguing that there is this real continuity between them. So just to bring it back again tediously to this very specific question of communion for the divorce and remarried, I think there have been attempts to interpret the footnote and everything else in Amoris Laetitia as saying, look, there are provisional circumstances when people are in troubled relationships and bad situations and don't have a full understanding of the Catholic faith where they might take communion provisionally on their way to regularizing their situation or escaping from this relationship or something. That to me seems like the most plausible reading of the, that puts the documents in continuity. It puts John Paul II's view on this and Francis's apparent view in this, of this in sort of in continuity with one another. So if we look back 50 or 100 years from now and say, look, there was clear continuity, that's, that's the way I could imagine it happening. The problem is, again, that the, what seems to me to be the liberal endgame, if not the Pope's own endgame, is not a situation where communion for the remarried is this sort of provisional, temporary pastoral solution, but a situation where second marriages, as long as they're stable and have children, are effectively regularized and people aren't, it's the opposite of doing it provisionally. It's doing it, it's temporarily abstaining on your way to a permanent return that, you know, that essentially, um, essentially, again, vitiates the church's commitment to indissolubility. So the more the second interpretation comes to predominate, as it clearly has in many of the dioceses interpreting Amoris in an expansive way, the harder it becomes for me to say as a Catholic that there is real continuity between these two popes on this issue, and the harder it becomes to defend the idea that the church proceeds through development rather than crisis and rupture. May I have one sentence? One. <laughs> the Catholic tradition is not a mineral, it's an animal. It moves, it adapts, it grows. That's my image. So here, I tend to avoid systematically the word continuity, discontinuity, because this is not, not, uh, not appropriate to understand the Catholic tradition. So there are differences, yes. Not every difference is a discontinuity and is, is, is a rupture. We could go on until well, can midnight. I, can I just I add, we could, but could I just ask, so in, in your view, a priest, churchman, layperson, whomever, in the year 1372. Who, 1372. 1372, to pick a year. 872, 1572. Okay. I don't know why I'm going with 72s. Um, a person in that era who told a remarried person, um, King of England, hypothetically. No, um, the, no, an, an, ordin an ordinary, no, an, no, an ordinary and much more sympathetic uh, figure that they should not, that they should abstain from, from communion. Was that person telling them a lie? Not a, I mean, a lie is a strong term since they weren't conscious, but a, a falsehood. Was that a, was, were, were those people misled Theology. into thinking that they were, you know, that, that, they, that they had to abstain and be separated in some sense? Was that, were they misled? I, there are different responses to the same question in different times. There's a very, a very important passage of Congar in Tour of Four when he says, what Augustine said at his time was Catholic, the use of the same words of Augustine in the 17th century were not Catholic. So here, it's, so one very important notion is the notion of case, so which comes from the Latin casus, which comes from the verb cadere, to fall where the theory falls. You have real situations where the theory falls and you have to make a decision. So here, I don't want to underestimate, the, uh, but 
But is, is the there idea is that one... there are more? Is the idea that there are just more of those cases now? Of course. But I mean, if you're in, you know, I mean, th this is not the first era in human history where we have confronted the possibility of failed marriages. I mean, I, I guess I don't, the sexual revolution, it seems to me that you're treating the sexual revolution more than Vatican II as this event of sort of a rupture in human nature, the human experience of sexuality and so on, on the other side of which things can't obtain. But if you go back to these controversies, I mean, the Roman era was hardly a world unfamiliar with homosexuality, divorce, remarriage, all of these, all of these right. things, right? So and yet the church held up a more um, you know, a more absolute seeming standard so, generally. I mean, marriage has a very long history. So there's no marriage basically until the fifth century. I mean, so. I know what you mean. It's very complicated. Yeah. This mess about marriage and divorce annulment is not a product of Francis. Synod of the family of 1980, the line was we have too many annulments because they have become a Catholic divorce. So no annulments anymore. The synod of two years ago, all these bishops say, wow, we should have more annulments. <laughs> so this is a mess that we are all into. And I don't think it can be solved by accusing one pope or one cardinal on one bishop conference of tampering with Catholic teaching. It's more complicated than that. There's a huge work that has to be done, like for, I mean, Ask an Augustinian theologian what he thinks or she thinks of the theology of the body. There's a lot of theologic work to do, to write, to explain. I think we are in the middle of this, uh, and it's, it's our church. And I think there is a, a way out uh, together that is much, much less dramatic then you see, I mean, I'm more optimistic, maybe because I'm Italian, but I don't know. <laughs> but that's, that's my, my take. <laughs> Thank you, I think that, that'll, be the last, that'll be the last word. Thank you very we'll much. We'll repair for here's, some here's gelato a, afterwards. Yes, exactly, yeah. The Italians win the cuisine, at least. So, <laughs> at so. least. <laughs> Thank you very much. We, um, it was a great evening, a failure on my part. And in, in I said we wouldn't leave this room until we settled every question. But I guess the uh, census fidelium continues, and as I believe, as it should do. And this was some small part in it. Thank you both very much. Please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs> This was really modeling, I, this is really modeling, I think, what we need to see in our church, if I could put in the piano player's uh, opinion here. Let's just vow to meet here again, let's say in five years for the 10th anniversary of Francis or the uh, looking forward to Vatican III and the opening and what it will bring. Thank you again. A final quick word to, to Tom or no? Thank you again. Okay.